Thank you for joining me as I begin my examination of the book The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel from My Atheist Perspective. In this video, I'm going to cover the first two chapters of the book, but first, since this is the first video of a new series, I always like to reintroduce the concept of the Atheist Read series, just in case anyone is joining me for the first time. So if you are an old hand at this, and this is not your first Atheist Read series, you know exactly what this is, you can go ahead and skip ahead to the time code on the screen right now, and that'll take you directly to me starting in with uh, the first chapter. You can skip the preliminaries. Now, for those of you who stuck around, um, as you may or may not know, I have now done Atheist Read series. This is the 25th time. This is the 25th Atheist Read series I have done, and this will be the last one. I announced uh, back in January when I began my uh, 23rd Atheist Read series that this year was gonna be the end of the Atheist Read series. Um, and this will be the final book that I review. And I am sort of coming full circle because the very first Atheist Reads was an Atheist Reads The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. This is an Atheist Reads The Case for a Creator also by Lee Strobel. So now the circle is complete. The whole point of this, <laughs> the whole point of this entire exercise has been to provide an atheist response to Christian apologetic arguments not to provide a definitive response, not to say, I'm right, they're wrong, period. You have to agree with me. You have to make the same arguments I make. You have to respond how I respond. Just to offer a response. Because I have found that hearing what other people have to say has greatly helped me in the past to crystallize and clarify my own thinking. When I first read The Case for Christ many, many years ago as a, as a younger person, I had a feeling that I disagreed with it. I knew that I thought it was wrong. I knew that it wasn't persuasive, but I couldn't quite articulate why. And it wasn't until years later, after I had done a lot more reading, after I had watched uh, videos and listened to interviews uh, and, and immersed myself more in the atheism versus religion debates and conversations, that I began to have a more surer footing, and I began to have more stronger feelings and opinions of my own as, a, as to what I thought and why I thought a given argument was wrong, why I thought a given book or a given uh, debate or a given sermon or speech or what have you was not convincing or compelling to me. So hopefully, if you are watching this and you are an atheist and you find yourself in that same predicament where you just, you encounter Christian arguments, you encounter religious arguments generally, you encounter apologetics maybe from well-meaning relatives or friends who regard you as a seeker or as someone who is lost and looking for answers, and you can't quite figure out how to articulate your response, how to put your disagreement into words, hopefully this and the other Atheist Read series I've done, if you choose to watch those as well, will help you. Not so you can parrot what I say, but so you can hear what I say and take that as a starting point to do your own thinking and come to your own conclusions and put things into your own words. That's if you're an atheist and you're, and you're coming to this from that perspective. Now, if you're watching this as a Christian or as a religious believer in general, hopefully you will take from this a response from an atheist perspective to Christian arguments that will hopefully be thoughtful, sometimes a little sarcastic, sometimes a little snarky, but hopefully thoughtful and fair and understandable. So even though you probably won't come to agree with me, you won't deconvert as a result of this, and that's not the point of this, to try and deconvert anybody, but hopefully you'll come to an understanding of why an atheist feels the way he feels and why these arguments are not compelling to a person of my attitude and, and my viewpoint. So that's the point of the whole thing. That's, that's my, what my hope has been all along, and it's just as much a hope for this final series as it has been for all of the ones coming before it. Now, the subject of this final series will be The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel is a former journalist who used to write for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he is currently a teaching pastor at Woodlands Church near Houston, Texas, and a professor at Houston Baptist University. He is the author of nearly two dozen books, including The Case for Christ, which was the subject of my very first Atheist Read series. 
and this one, The Case for a Creator, which is the subject of my last in Atheist Read series, and which has uh, was originally published in 2004. As has been my usual practice for the last couple of years when I do these series, I will be reading and referring to the Kindle version of the book, not one of the print versions. It's based on and responding to the Kindle edition. Um, the book has a total of 11 chapters. This video will cover the first two chapters, and then every subsequent video in the series will cover one chapter each. So this series, when it is finished, will consist of a total of 10 videos. Now, hello people who skipped ahead. Let's start with chapter one of The Case for a Creator, which is titled White-Coated Scientists versus Black-Robed Preachers. The book begins with a you-are-there description of the bustling newsroom of the Chicago Tribune as the various writers, editors, and copyboys rush to finish the afternoon edition. It's 1974. Lee Strobel is in his rookie year as a reporter. He tells us he's just three months out of journalism school, and he's hungry. He's eager to prove himself. So the assistant managing editor calls young Strobel over to talk about some wire copy he's just received. It's an Associated Press report about violence erupting in West Virginia over school textbooks that some felt were anti-God. Yet, uh, or not yet a Christian, Strobel shakes his head at these hypocritical, judgmental so-called Christians. And I can kind of understand that. I mean, yeah, you sh that's the proper response. Sort of disapproving shaking of your head. The editor describes people being shot at and schools being bombed by people upset about the textbooks. You don't have to be an atheist to have a problem with that. Most Christians would object to their fellow Christians setting off bombs and shooting at people over textbooks they didn't approve of. At least I would hope so. There's me probably being naive again. I would hope that most Christians, if they heard about other people, whether they were Christians or not, shooting, up peop shooting at people and, and uh, setting fires and blowing up stuff, over textbooks, they would think, oh no, that's, that's a bad idea. And just, that's just my hope. Um, the editor sends young Strobel to West Virginia to get the story, and he warns him. He says, these hillbillies hate reporters. And he tells him that they've already beaten up two journalists who have sought after the story. So be careful, young Strobel. So he's afraid, but he's eager to prove himself on his first big assignment. So Strobel travels to Charleston, West Virginia, and then he starts interviewing people there and in the surrounding area. And he describes what he found when he got there. Quote, Many parents were keeping their kids out of school. Coal miners had walked off the job in wildcat strikes, threatening to cripple the local economy. Empty school buses were being shot at. Firebombs had been lobbed at some vacant classrooms. Picketers were marching with signs saying even hillbillies have constitutional rights. Violence had left two people seriously injured. Intimidation and threats were rampant. Over textbooks, just, I want to remind you, firebombing classrooms, shooting at school buses, staging street protests over lost constitutional rights. Why? Because they're being killed indiscriminately by police? Because parents are being ripped from their children? Because they're losing the right to marry? They're losing their health care? Any, any, any of those reasons? Creeping fascism? No. No. They didn't like something that was in the textbooks. They didn't like something that was in the textbook. Uh, young Strobel interviews local officials and activists. A minister's wife complains that the books will teach children to not love God. A community activist celebrates the textbooks by uh, saying that they reflect the viewpoints of more people than just white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Well, that's why they're upset. There you go. Perfect. Um, and the recently resigned school superintendent blamed both sides. See, so there's really nothing new under the sun. Um, so what was in these textbooks anyway? What was so inflammatory, no pun intended, to get people so upset about what's in these books? Well, some people were angry at sections of some textbooks that asked students challenging ethical questions, such as, do you think there is ever a time when cheating, as in like cheating on a test at school, might be okay, might be right? Questions such as these undermined Christian values, some parents said. Yeah, because Christian morality is handed down from an authority and never questioned. Morals are not to be thought about and examined. They are to be obeyed. 
That's what makes us moral creatures, our ability to mindlessly follow orders, right? But young Strobel identifies something else these people are upset about, something deeper than objectionable material and textbooks. It is change they're resisting, new ideas, a culture that is transforming all around them. He interviews a local business owner who complains about a textbook that refers to the Tower of Babel and the theory of divine origin of language. This business owner says, the word of God is not a theory. They want to teach our kids that divine origin is just a theory, but that evolution is a scientific fact? The business owner goes on to declare that without God, there's no basis for morality and that the removal of Christianity as the foundation for ethics is the reason why this country is going to hell in a handbasket, quote unquote. Well, smart-ass atheist young Strobel quietly mocks the businessman's beliefs. Doesn't he know that evolution is a fact? Doesn't he realize the Bible is a book of fairy tales, the poor simpleton? He asks the businessman if he ever has doubts about his religious faith. And the businessman says, God's fingerprints are all over the world. And he's absolutely sure of it because there's no other way to explain the existence of nature and human beings. <laughs> evolution. <laughs> Um, so looking to interview some of the people who had been turning to violence over the textbooks, because he's mostly been interviewing people who are activists or county officials, government folks. He wants to find some of the people who are actually pissed off about this, that they're shooting up the empty school buses or firebombing the empty classroom. So he takes a photographer and they go to a protest rally and they are marked as journalists almost immediately. And they are set upon as though they're surrounded by pod people and they've been discovered that they're, they're intruders. They don't belong. Uh, they are, uh, Strobel describes it as they're surrounded and the crowd is surging forward to grab them. And then a preacher gets up on the stage and takes the microphone and kind of calls the crowd off, calls the crowd off. He calls for peace. And he says, Hey, I've seen this reporter, this Strobel kid around town asking questions for the last few weeks. And I think he just wants to tell the story like it is. And I think he's going to treat us fair. So let's just relax and, and, and ease up and not kill him. And it works. The crowd instantly calms down. And you know, that move probably wouldn't work at a modern day Trump rally because the crowds there have been educated about what lying, hateful traitors the journalists are, what with their fake news and all. So it was, it was, a, more, it was a, an, a more innocent time when Lee Strobel was surrounded by angry, Bible-thumping hillbillies, and one person was able to call for peace, and they were all like, yeah, okay, sounds good, and they backed off. So they stay for the rally, they watch the rally, and then after the rally, Strobel writes up his article, and then he flies home to Chicago, but he's still preoccupied with the beliefs of those angry people back in West Virginia. Why couldn't they just accept that evolution was a fact? And that because of that fact, there was no universal morality and no God. Well, and this is one of the central sort of misdirections of the book, I can tell already, this false dichotomy between evolution and religion. You can accept that evolution is a fact, and still believe in God and objective morality. I don't, but they don't necessarily contradict each other. Lots of Christians do believe in both God and evolution, and many major Christian churches, including the Catholic, Anglican, slash Episcopalian, Methodist, and Lutheran churches, accept that evolution is a fact and that it is not incompatible with their versions of Christianity. This is not a deal breaker for a, a large number of believers. Strobel outlines what he calls five inescapable conclusions if Darwinism is true. And those five inescapable conclusions are there's no evidence for God, there's no life after death, there's no absolute foundation for right and wrong, there's no ultimate meaning for life, and people don't really have free will. Now, I can't stress this enough. None of those five things are inescapable conclusions in the light of Darwinism being true. Accepting as a fact that life evolved from common ancestors and that the theory of evolution is an accurate description of how that evolutionary process works doesn't impose any conclusions about the existence or non-existence of any gods, the existence or non-existence of life after death, 
the foundations of morality, the meaning of life, or the existence of free will. What Strobel is saying here is utterly nonsensical. Evolution and these five inescapable conclusions have nothing to do with each other. I'm an atheist and I believe evolution is a fact, but you don't have to be an atheist to believe evolution is a fact. And you know what? It doesn't happen all that often, but if you're an atheist, you don't have to believe that evolution is a fact. The two things don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. You can believe in God or not believe in God. You can accept that evolution is a fact or deny evolution is a fact. You can mix and match those any which way you want. They don't have anything to do with each other. There are no five inescapable conclusions about religion and spirituality and life after death and the meaning of life and the existence of free will that are tied to the acceptance of the fact of evolution. But anyway, we're near the end of the first chapter and Strobel ends the chapter this way, quote, to me, the controversy in West Virginia was a symbolic last gasp of an archaic belief system hurtling toward oblivion. As more and more young people are taught the ironclad evidence for evolution, then belief in an invisible God will fade into a fringe superstition confined only to dreary backwoods hamlets like Campbell's Creek, West Virginia. As far as I was concerned, that day couldn't come soon enough. Well, that's what you call foreshadowing, children. Because, see, young Lee Strobel is destined to grow into Lee Strobel, warrior for Christ. And he'll be eating those words before too long. You know, this chapter was a somewhat unwelcome <laughs> reintroduction for me to Strobel's writing style. As he did with The Case for Christ, he feels compelled to craft this book as a narrative, not just sharing anecdotes or making arguments, but writing scenes, dramatic scenes. The scenes aren't all that compelling, Sadly, they're actually not that dramatic, and Strobel's writing is bland and kind of terrible for the most part, so it comes across less as a riveting piece of narrative nonfiction and more like the work of a frustrated, failed novelist. Anyway, on to chapter two. Chapter two is titled, The Images of Evolution. For this chapter, Strobel winds the clock back even further. Chapter one was 1974, chapter two is 1966 when Strobel was 14 years old, a freshman in high school. He writes of how he enjoyed his freshman biology class because he liked learning how things work. As a youngster, he says, he had hurled the locomotive of his electric train set against the floor to try to crack it open and figure out how it worked. And he says he didn't understand why his father was so upset when he saw him smashing his train set against the floor. Holy shit, Lee. So, you were a troubled kid, it's safe to say. I mean, I had an electric train set when I was a kid, and I was fascinated by how it worked too, but I never tried to smash the thing open by throwing it into the floor. Like, Jesus, man. Strobel's trust in science had been shaped by growing up in the 50s during the dawn of the space age. Science also provided him with a solid foundation as he came of age in the 60s, watching as, and this is a quote from him, watching as our nation began unraveling and relativism and situational ethics were starting to create a quicksand of morality when one tradition after another was being upended. I suspect situational ethics will prove to be a recurring boogeyman in this book. He's mentioned it twice now. Also, so much for that foreshadowing. It only took him one chapter to start sounding exactly like those people in West Virginia who were bombing schools over textbooks. Also, if he starts in with his our nation was unraveling shit, he's gonna lose me so fast. What traditions that were upended in the 1960s does he wish we'd held on to exactly? Jim Crow, segregation, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, illegal abortion, actually. Okay, definitely that last one. Um, so being a visual learner, Strobel shares four images that stuck with him as he began to learn about evolution. Those four images are the laboratory apparati of the Miller-Urey experiment, which showed that the building blocks of life could have been produced naturally by conditions on the primordial earth. Darwin's tree of life, which illustrates how life forms descended from common ancestors. Haeckel's drawings of embryos, which purported to show similarities between various vertebrate species at their earliest stages of development, and 
the missing link, which Strobel uses to describe uh, the Archaeopteryx. He calls that the missing link because it was a transitional species between dinosaurs and modern birds. Those are the four images of evolution that stuck in his brain. Now, Strobel does acknowledge that not everyone views evolution as pointing necessarily toward atheism. He quotes a series of scientists and philosophers who believe acceptance of evolution as a fact and belief in God are not incompatible. But he then just kind of waves this off. He dismisses it, declaring that personally, he never understood how Darwinism left any meaningful role for God. Maybe you should ask the people who think that it does and see what they think. Maybe a book supposedly dedicated to interviewing experts on science about conflicts between science and religion to find the truth would be a great venue to ask some of those scientists yourself. Sit down and interview them. Find scientists who believe that evolution and religion are compatible and ask them why they think that makes sense. Since it doesn't make sense to you, that might be interesting, huh? Are you going to do that? Maybe he'll do that. Anyway, believing that Darwinism doesn't leave a meaningful role for God is fine if that's what he thinks. Lots of people think that, some of whom are atheists, by the way, some of whom are people of various religious faiths, but it's not a fact. It's not objectively true that evolution requires atheism to be true. That's just an opinion. Strobel seems to be trying to have it both ways. He acknowledges that not everyone believes theism and evolution are incompatible, then waves it off and says, but yeah, they are though. After briefly quoting a few scientists and philosophers who believe that theism and evolution are compatible, he presents much lengthier quotations and summaries of the beliefs of those who take the opposite view. He spends a few pages quoting Stephen C. Meyer of the Discovery Institute and also Nancy Piercy, who is the author of Finding Truth, subject of a past and Atheist Read series, both of whom insist that, as Piercy puts it, you can have God or natural selection, but not both. Strobel also quotes Piercy saying that Darwin himself rejected theistic evolution, saying that if we include God in the process, then it would no longer be natural selection because we would assume that God would be making sure that the right variations occurred. Okay, but you know we're allowed to disagree with Darwin and still accept that evolution is a real thing, right? I mean, Darwin formulated the first widely accepted theory to describe how evolution works. His work was revolutionary and incredibly important and still is to this day, but you don't have to think he was right about everything in order to accept that evolution is a fact. Darwin, it turns out, wasn't right about everything. And the fact that Darwin considered evolution to be a natural process that God played no part in, and the fact that many modern evolutionary scientists hold the same view, doesn't mean that other people can't hold a different interpretation. It also doesn't mean that you can't hold the interpretation that evolution was a natural process and God did not play an active role in it, but there is still a God up there somewhere doing something, as a lot of people believe. These two things are not incompatible. It's fairly easy, actually, to find ways of accepting evolution as described by science and also believing in a God if that is what you feel that you are compelled to do. It's, it's really easy to reconcile these two things. But again, I'm an atheist. I don't think there is a God. I don't think you need to assume a God in order for evolution to work or make sense. But some people do, and they do it in such a way that their understanding of evolution and their faith in their God make room for each other. And it's simply dishonest to keep insisting that accepting evolution requires you to relinquish your religious faith. We're dealing with matters of opinion and subjective judgment and interpretation, not inarguable fact. Anyway, Strobel writes about how, as a teenager, he experienced the effects of Darwinism as a universal acid, which is how Daniel Dennett has described it, a universal acid that eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview. And Strobel says, quote, my worldview is being revolutionized, all right, yet in my youthful optimism, I wasn't ready to examine some of the disheartening implications of my new philosophy. 
I conveniently ignored the grim picture painted by British atheist Bertrand Russell, who wrote about how science had presented us with a world that was purposeless and void of meaning. Strobel then quotes a bit from Russell's book, Why I Am Not a Christian, and here is the passage that he quotes. This is Bertrand Russell quoted by Lee Strobel, quote, that man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried under the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Now that is Bertrand Russell from Why I Am Not a Christian. And Strobel transitions from this Russell quotation into a description of how he reveled in his atheism by indulging in the sexual revolution and enjoying the freedom from God's moral strictures. In other words, evolution leads to atheism and atheism leads to hedonism and sexual promiscuity. But Russell didn't draw a line from the unyielding despair he described to hedonism and sexual promiscuity. No, he argued that in the face of such a hostile universe, people are apt to deal with their predicament in another way. Strobel did not choose to share these words of Russell from the very next paragraph. Once again, this is quoting Bertrand Russell from Why I'm Not a Christian. The very next paragraph from the question or from the passage I just quoted. Quote, How in such an alien and inhuman world can so powerless a creature as man preserve his aspirations untarnished? A strange mystery it is that nature, omnipotent but blind, in the revolutions of her secular hurryings through the abysses of space, has brought forth at last a child, subject still to her power, but gifted with sight, with knowledge of good and evil, with the capacity of judging all the works of his unthinking mother. In spite of death, the mark and seal of the parental control, man is yet free during his brief years to examine, to criticize, to know, and in imagination to create. To him alone, in the world with which he is acquainted, this freedom belongs. And in this lies his superiority to the resistless forces that control his outward life. Now that's reminiscent of the way I and other atheists have said we deal with the knowledge that we live in a godless universe where our lives as individuals and as a species are relatively short and destined ultimately to be obliterated by time and the forces of nature. How do we derive meaning and joy and purpose in such a world? We think, we learn, we interact with each other, we create. And what do we create, according to Russell? How has humanity learned to cope with our mortal existence in this vast, cold, and different universe? We invent gods. We invent gods to impose some kind of order on the world. And eventually, those gods become instruments of power by which some people can force others to submit to their will. Here's one more quote from a couple of pages later in that same chapter of Russell's Why I Am Not a Christian. Quote, when we have realized that power is largely bad, that man with his knowledge of good and evil is but a helpless atom in a world which has no such knowledge, the choice is again presented to us. Shall we worship force or shall we worship goodness? Shall our God exist and be evil or shall he be recognized as the creation of our own conscience? What does the cold, indifferent universe lead us to do? Create gods for us to worship 
and submit to. And how do we find meaning and freedom in such a system? Acknowledge the gods for what they are, human creations. And instead of worshiping them, we dedicate ourselves to living according to what is good rather than what an invented God or those who claim to speak for an invented God tell us to do. And it's interesting that Strobel considers Russell a fit source for a description of the despair of a godless universe, but not a fit source for a description of how we as a species have dealt with it or how we ought to deal with it. Unyielding despair is a popular phrase of Russell's that apologists love to quote. They say, that's what an atheist has to look forward to. Bertrand Russell even said it, unyielding despair. But that was hardly Russell's final word on the subject. He had much more to say in his life, in that book, on that page. Interesting also that Strobel's own life story reflects the larger story of humanity that Russell describes in that book. Strobel ultimately chose to deal with life and the finality of death in a godless universe in the same way much of humanity has chosen to deal with it, by telling himself a different story by embracing a God that he didn't quite invent, but that someone else invented, and he helps to perpetuate by embracing it and believing and teaching and writing books like this one. Strobel presumably thinks his life story contradicts Russell's description of humanity's mortal predicament, but it's actually a damn good match. Well, besides all the sex he was having, Strobel writes that as a young man, he sought to leave his mark through his work as a journalist. He determined to worry about the finality of death later and to do a lot of living in the meantime. And he's trying to position this as sort of a short-sighted and ultimately futile and unfulfilling way to deal with mortality and bring meaning to life. But it's worked out just fine for me so far and for lots of other people as well. What's so wrong with deriving meaning in your life from your work, from trying to do your part to make the world a better place? What's wrong with recognizing that you're only here for a short time and trying to make the most of the time you have? In light of the acceptance that we are mortal and there is no life after death, what, what other options are there other than just giving in to despair? Strobel takes us through an abbreviated retelling of the events that led to his epic investigation of the claims of Christianity, which he recreated for his first book, The Case for Christ. Briefly, he and his wife were atheists. Then his wife converted to Christianity. Strobel was annoyed at this, so he decided to investigate whether or not Christianity was true, determined to prove that it was false and convince his wife to abandon it. But, and here's a shocker in an apologetics book, he found that he couldn't disprove it. There was too much evidence. It just had to be true. But that was that book. In this book, this totally different book, Strobel tells us he will focus on a different kind of investigation, a scientific investigation. He shares three questions which guided his scientific investigation into Christianity. Those questions are, are science and faith doomed to always be at war? Does the latest scientific evidence point point toward or away from the existence of God? And are the images of evolution that led him to atheism still valid in light of the best recent science? The investigation might focus on a different area than the one depicted in the case for Christ, but the method will sound familiar to anyone who read that book. Strobel says, quote, my approach would be to cross-examine authorities in various scientific disciplines about the most current findings in their fields. In selecting these experts, I sought doctorate-level professors who have unquestioned expertise, are able to communicate in accessible language, and who refuse to limit themselves only to the politically correct world of naturalism or materialism. After all, it wouldn't make sense to rule out any hypothesis at the outset. I wanted the freedom to pursue all possibilities. Isn't that a nice rationalization for not talking to actual scientists? No, I don't want to talk to people who limit themselves to naturalism. 
Remember how Strobel's objective, hard-hitting, all I care about is the truth investigation of Christianity and the case for Christ involved him talking only to Christians? Asking them softball questions that set them up to expound on all the reasons their religion was true while Strobel challenged their arguments feebly, if at all? I wonder if this book's investigation will be any different. Time will tell. Strobel says of his attitude toward this investigation, I would stand in the shoes of the skeptic. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Um, I was trained not only to ask questions, Strobel writes, but to go wherever the answers would take me. And I trust you have the same attitude. He also promises that we will be dazzled by the startling new narrative that science has been busy writing over the past few decades. Can we read this startling new narrative in respected peer-reviewed scientific journals? What do you think? Well, we'll find out in the next video, actually, because that's the end of this chapter. The next chapter features Strobel's first interview with an expert. Which authority in their field will tough as nails journalist Lee Strobel interrogate in order to find the truth about which is true? Darwinism or Christianity? Because it has to be one or the other. Even though it doesn't, well, I know who it is, but I will let you all sit in suspense, unless, of course, you are reading the book along with me and you just skipped ahead to the next chapter and you know who the expert is. But anyway, we'll deal with that next time in the next video, which will deal with chapter three, which is titled Doubts About Darwinism. That's it for this video. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for joining me for one final go round with the Atheist Read series. I'm looking forward to this one, and I'm also looking forward to wrapping it up and having a nice finished body of work with the Atheist Read series and moving on to other things. But Let's have fun and let's hopefully do justice to this book before we finish up uh, the Atheist Read series for good. So thank you all for joining me. I'll be back next time to look at chapter three. Um, if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe to the channel if you're not subbed already. And also please, please, please consider helping me to continue making the videos that I make on this channel by becoming a patron through Patreon, a supporter with a small monthly donation, um, as little as $1 a month really, really helps me out. If you can afford to pledge more than $1 a month and you think I'm worth more than $1 a month, um, if you pledge $5 a month, you can take advantage of some extra perks in the Patreon campaign, including um, getting to have a sneak peek of video scripts, including scripts for the An Atheist Read series. I will be posting the scripts for the episodes of this series a day or two before the video goes up. So if you're a $5 plus patron, you can check those out, get a, a sense of what's coming, have a script in front of you to follow along. Some people I know like to do that, or some people just would prefer to read the thing instead of watching me yammer on for over half an hour about it. So if you are a patron of $5 a month or more, you can take advantage of that. Whatever level you are pledging at, if you are a patron, I thank you so much. If you are considering becoming a patron, I appreciate the consideration. And if you are not a patron and you're not thinking about becoming one, but you have watched the video, thank you for that. I appreciate the support in whatever form it takes. I thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.